Hello again, everyone. I'm Kyle Gerald, and I have the privilege of being the pastor of Countryside Free Methodist Church in Sandusky, Michigan. The message you are about to hear was previously recorded. If you'd like to catch one of our services in action, we'd love to have you stop by for our 1030 a.m. service or check it out on our Facebook page at Countryside Free Methodist Church. God bless you, and thank you for listening. If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. And as I often say, we are going to get there in just a moment. But before we do, I first just want to highlight the fact that we have some new devotional resources for you today. Out in the lobby, on the table out there, you should see there's a new stack of our daily bread, the little devotional books. And then there are also some of the D6 Fusion devotional guides out there. There's one for families with kids at home and one for families that don't have kids at home. So um, that's the smaller one. And the, the, big, the one for families is a little bigger, looks like a magazine kind of thing out there. Um, so both of those, Daily Bread and the Fusion D6 stuff, um, those all start in September. But we want to make sure that you are aware of them and that you can get them in hand before September gets here. So you're ready to go when September 1st rolls around. As a general rule, our Sunday morning messages follow along the same themes and scriptures as the materials that are in the D6, the fusion guides. And uh, so you can just kind of keep track and throughout the week with where we're at in our message and series. Um, Having said that, I'm going to say, though, that we are going to take a little bit of a detour today as we're not following it exactly. However, we're staying in the same book, in the same general ballpark, right? We're going we're gonna to hop over Ephesians chapter 4 and go into Ephesians chapter 5 here in just a moment. Um, but I want to encourage you at some point, even today, to go home and read through Ephesians chapter 4. You guys, it is loaded with wisdom from Paul about how we are to live in this thing called the body of Christ. And that's one of his main themes there in the book of Ephesians. So I don't want you to miss it. So go back and process that at some point here today. We've been exploring uh, in Ephesians this idea of purposeful living. We saw early on how this kind of strategic, on-purpose living starts in Christ, and it also is powered by his love. In fact, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 5 make a great bridge between last week and this week. So check it out. Verse 1 and 2 in chapter 5 says, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, Just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. We talked a little bit last week about that incredible love of Christ and about how it's not some mushy, soft, worldly version of love. But even as you see in these lines, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God, you see that it is an intense, you can build your life on this rock kind of love. That's the love of Christ that we're talking about. So today we're, we're going to continue as we see that not only does purposeful living start in Christ, and not only is it powered by his love, but it also grows in his light. So pick up the reading with me there in Ephesians chapter 5, now at verse 3, where Paul says, but among you there must not be even a hint of, and I'm going to hit the pause button, Okay, because I don't want us to miss what Paul is saying here when he says that there must not be a hint of what comes next. Google Online Dictionary defines a hint as a slight or indirect indication or suggestion. So keep that thought in mind. We're going to back up to the beginning of that phrase that I just started. And I'm also going to insert some other similar words as we go forward, okay? Just to make sure we get this. But among you, there must not be Even a hint, a clue, an inkling, a suggestion, an indication. There must not be an indicator, a sign, or a signal of sexual immorality or any kind of impurity or of greed because these are improper for God's holy people. Nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk, or coarse joking, which are out of place, but rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure, no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Folks, we don't dig down to the nitty-gritty details of the sinful life every single Sunday, but we need to be reminded that the kind of life that is pleasing to God, this purposeful life, this on 
purpose, strategic life. It is serious stuff, okay? And it means being intentional in growing in the light, in growing in Christ-likeness. Paul says that there shouldn't be even a hint of any of that kind of stuff we just mentioned in our lives. And he goes on in verse 6, Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. These two lines here kind of reminded me of campaign promises that we often hear, right? To quote Mary Poppins, those are pie crust promises, easily made, easily broken. Anybody remember that line from Mary Poppins? But seriously, though, I, I think that Paul is saying, don't partner with those who shower you with empty words about all those things about in the darkness. Don't partner with those who are comfortable living in spiritual and moral darkness. Over in his second letter to the Corinthians, Paul said it this way, don't be yoked together with unbelievers. For what do righteousness and wickedness have in common? Or what fellowship can light have with darkness? So purposeful living involves growing in the light towards Christ-likeness. And it involves often confession on our part before God of those behaviors, those mindsets that we just mentioned, as well as repentance. Our willful, intentional efforts to, in the power of Christ, move in the opposite direction towards him, towards holiness, and away from darkness. I want to give you three big takeaways today pertaining to our growth and purposeful living in Christ and in his light. Okay, so if you're taking notes, here's number one. Number one, we grow in Christ as we dump the junk. Okay, you probably heard that phrase before, dump the junk. Have you ever tried to run a race with like a 50-pound backpack on your back? Guess what? It's going to slow you down, right? The writer of Hebrews says it in this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. Get rid of that sin stuff. Dump the junk. Confess it to God. Repent and fix your eyes on on Jesus. We grow in Christ as we dump the junk. Paul continues in verse 8. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now I'm going to pause there just for a second and say, you know what? He doesn't say you were once in darkness or in the light. He says you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, and find out what pleases the Lord. This fruit of the light that he's talking about here sounds a lot like fruit of the Spirit that he mentions over in Galatians chapter 5, where he said, but the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, and patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Paul uses this word fruit here in both of these cases, fruit of the light and fruit of the spirit. And you guys, I think that is just a brilliant word picture for us. And, and here's why I say that. Because when we come to Jesus and we submit our lives and our will to him, God gives us the gift of his Holy Spirit. And right away, Holy Spirit goes to work inside of us, in our hearts, in our spirits, starting to change us from the inside out. And we start to grow and develop those fruits that we just mentioned, the fruit of the light and the fruit of the Spirit. But God's bigger plan is that we will work with him to continue to cultivate those things in our lives and make them even more fruitful. Let me give you a quick personal example. When we first moved to our last home in Holly, Michigan, we had uh, about four acres of property, and we had a fence in the middle of our property that had some, some grapevines growing on it. And I don't know if they were wild grapes or if somebody had planted them, but by the time we got there, they were wild, okay? Um, so, you know, we get these small little very sour grapes. Um, but then we had to put in a new septic field, and we had to go 
and take out the fence, and the grapes went with them. So, you know, but we decided we want to still have grapes sometimes, so we planted a few more grapevines in a different part of our property. After a few years, we started getting some, some nice grapes. And I started doing a little bit of reading, and I, and I realized that, you know what, the experts say that if you want to increase, you know, crop yield and maximum productivity and best grapes, you got to do what? You got you to trim those things back. You got to prune those grapevines back to a certain point every year. And you guys, I'd never done anything like this before. I, I, was, I was kind of freaking out. I was like, wait, wait, what? You want me to cut off this branch that produced some pretty good grapes last year and, and hope that it grows back and gives me more grapes? That just seems totally wrong. But I went out there with my clippers, you know, my whatever garden tools I had, and, and fear and trembling, I started lopping them off just like, you know, they said in the books and, and cutting them back the way they said. And sure enough, the experts were right. We had more grapes and better grapes than ever, ever before. It's like I couldn't believe it. But you know what? When we work with God, who's the expert, we follow his expert guidance. And we do our part to tend to those fruits of light in the spirit. Guess what? We're going to see even bigger, better harvest of those fruits in our lives. Second big takeaway, we grow in Christ as we work with God in tending our spiritual fruit. We grow in Christ as we work with him in tending our spiritual fruit. And guys, I think there's probably also a lesson for all of our churches here today as well in that we tend to cling to ministries and programs that have been fruitful in the past but are not seeing really any fruit anymore. We hold on to them with a death grip. We don't want to let those things go because we got a lot of good memories and there was a lot of good fruit there in the past, right? When in reality, we probably need to be cutting some of those things back so that we can see new, more fruit in other ways. We grow in Christ as we work with God in tending our spiritual fruit. Paul continues in verse 11, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. It is shameful even to mention what the disobedient do in secret. All right, this is one of those audience participation moments. Hands up if you have ever been in a cave before, an actual cave like underground, okay? All right, got, got, we got several. Good, good, good. Several years ago, my family and I, we went to Branson, Missouri on a vacation. And while we were there, um, they've got some great caves. And we went on one of those guided cave tours. And, uh, you know, we came, went into the cave. And, and when the whole group got into one of those larger inner chambers of the cave, uh, the tour guide said something like this. He said, you might want to grab hold of someone's hand or a railing or something for this as you experience this next part. Okay, and then they turned out the lights. And you guys, let me tell you something. Okay, there is dark, and then there is cave dark. Okay, there was like no light down there whatsoever. Zip, zero. And the reason that the guide suggested that you grab onto something is because when you experience darkness like that, especially in a cave, it immediately starts to mess with your sense of balance. As does just the whole atmosphere of being in a cave like that. I don't know if, if you've been there, you probably remember. I mean, the cave, that cave air is usually damp and kind of, you know, musty and stuff. And when those lights go out, not only is your balance affected, but all of a sudden it feels like that darkness is getting heavier and heavier by the second. And it even starts to make you feel like you can't breathe. It's like the lights just went off, but there's still, I know there's still oxygen in here. There's got to be. We were so thankful when those lights came back on. But you know what? The same thing is true in our lives. The deeds of darkness can very quickly become overwhelming, suffocating. It's just drowning out the life in our lives. But Paul says everything exposed by the light becomes visible, and everything that is illuminated becomes a light. We talked about this a little bit before. We don't have to see a light source directly to experience its effect in our world. I mean, we can look up at the lights here, you know, hanging from the ceiling. We can see those are light sources, but we can also see the effects of them, like on the ceiling. You guys, are, and our, our moon is a perfect case in point. The light that we receive from the moon at nighttime 
is not its own light source, but rather it is reflecting our world's main light source, which is the sun bouncing off the moon to our eyes. So we see that reflection. Here's our big takeaway number three. We grow in Christ as we step into and walk in his light. Paul says that's why it's said, wake up, sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Last week we saw how sin kills a person spiritually, but through Christ we can rise spiritually to live, and when we do, his light will reflect from us to those around us. He goes on in verse 15, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity, because the days are evil. We grow in Christ as we step into and walk in his light. With each opportunity we take to reflect God's light into our world, we grow ourselves. I mean, every time we reach out and we engage somebody in conversation that helps them a step closer to our Father, we grow also. Every time we reach out to help someone in need, we grow too. Every time we humbly stand for the truth, we grow. So each time we make the most of those opportunities, we grow as well. Verse 17 says, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. I think it would have been really nice if Paul would have said, understand what the Lord's will is. And here it is in two sentences. You know, that would have been, I, I think that would have been great. But he didn't do that. But if we, if we search for that phrase, God's will, throughout Scripture, and especially the New Testament, we get a lot of clues. It, it starts to develop into a picture that's pretty clear. Check out some of these verses from other books. Mark chapter 3, Jesus said, Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. So anyone who does God's will is close to Jesus. Actually, he would say in his family. Romans 12, he said, Don't conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So when our hearts, and minds, and spirits have been transformed by Christ, we will begin to understand better what God's will is for us. We can't fall into the traps that are in this world and expect to continue to be able to understand what God's will is. First Thessalonians chapter 4 says, it's God's will that you should be sanctified. There's a great one. You want it plain and simple. It is God's will that you should be sanctified. And it goes on that you should avoid sexual immorality. God's will involves our purity spiritually, mentally, physically. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So guess what? God's will involves giving thanks, not just in the good times either. 1 Peter, the book of 1 Peter has a number of things to say about God's will. In chapter 2 he says, For it is God's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So doing good is part of God's will. And with the benefit of you get to shut up people who are just speaking out foolishness. All right? That's a, good, that's a pretty good deal. First Peter chapter 3 says, It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. So it sounds like, guess what? Maybe part of God's will for some of us to suffer as we are doing those good things in our world. And First Peter chapter 4 says, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Well, if there was any doubt in the last verse, guess what? It's cleared up here. Yes, some will suffer for doing good in the world on God's behalf. We shouldn't be surprised at this. So if we put these verses together, we again start to see this picture of God's will, or at least part of it, and we see that it is for us to be sanctified, for us to be pure, inside and out, for us to be giving thanks. It is God's will for us to be doing good. And it is God's will that we be ready to suffer and not surprised if we do. 
all these kind of boil down to growing in and living in his light, not fumbling around in the darkness, not crashing into things and hurting ourselves or other people, but making the most of every opportunity to grow in him and to bring his light into our world. <clears throat> Let me read you this morning one more powerful passage of scripture on living and growing in the light. Words from Jesus himself, in Matthew chapter 5, he said this, You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So purposeful living starts in Christ. It's powered by his love, and it grows in his light. In his worship song, Reckless Love, Corey Asbury writes these words, There's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God Oh, it chases me down. It fights till I'm found. It leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. That's the kind of love that God has for us. And Jesus displayed for us with his life, death, and resurrection. And it's that kind of love that empowers us to serve, to come together, and to love even those who are least lovable in our world. Folks, it's time for us to light up the shadows. It is time for God's church to climb some mountains. It is time for us to kick down some walls that are keeping people from God. That's what God has done for us. That's what he did when he sent Jesus to this world, was to kick down the walls that separated people from their heavenly father. And I mentioned a few weeks ago that God's instrument of reconciliation to our world is Jesus. And Jesus' instrument of reconciliation to our world is us, the church. The baton has been passed to us to hand to take out into our world, to share his light, his love with those around us. It's our turn. It's our turn to step out there. Our job, our mission is the same as it has always been for the followers of Christ. To love God, love people, and make disciples. That's our job. That's our purpose here until Jesus comes. And if you're one of those that wants a few practical steps to get started, let me give you four this morning, all right? Practical steps. Here you go. Starting to accomplish our mission. Number one, find a place to grow. You might have heard this before. You know what? We have a, a number of Bible studies uh, available now, and we're going to have even more discipleship options when the fall starts. I just want to encourage you to continue to check out our bulletin or our webpage for more details on great places where you can continue to grow in your faith. Folks, everyone needs a smaller group of believers around them to encourage each other and challenge each other in their faith. It is an essential part of your spiritual development, okay? Find a place to grow. Secondly, find a place to serve. Everyone who calls themselves a follower of Christ is automatically, by definition, also a part of the body of Christ. Which means we've got stuff to do, just like your body parts all have a function. We all have a part to play in the great body of Christ. So I want to encourage you, if you're not yet serving in the body of Christ, find a place to serve. And I want to give you just a clue I, sh I, I shared with you some this morning, right there in the center of the bulletin, some places that are big needs right now. Great place to start if you're looking for a place to serve. Check those out. We also have some other opportunities down the hallway on the bulletin board. Check them out. Place to serve. Number three, find a place to shine. We are called to go into the world and to make disciples. 
And for most of us, that's going to mean finding a place in our community where we are rubbing shoulders with people who are not yet followers of Christ on a regular basis, okay? We need to go find one of those places where we can be talking to them, engaging them in conver conversation, encouraging them to come closer to God. Find a place to shine. Take those opportunities to begin reflecting Christ's light to them in that way. And number four, come back here and celebrate. All right, one of the main purposes of these Sunday morning gatherings is to celebrate what God is doing in and through his people. So when God is doing something in your life or you see him doing something in somebody else's life, tell somebody when you come back here. Let me know. Let's share it together. Let's celebrate what God's doing in his kingdom. And if we will do those four simple things, you guys, we will be well on our way to fulfilling Christ's mission for us here on planet Earth. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this time that we can come into your presence. God, and we can experience your light, the light of Jesus Christ in our world. And God, I pray that you would help each one here to become a reflector of that light back to our world. I pray that you would help us to dump the junk, get rid of anything that is keeping us from reflecting that light cleanly and purely out into our world. Help us to just leave it all behind right here today, God, so that we can go forward in a way that is honoring and pleasing to you and in a way that people will see you through us and be drawn to that love of Jesus Christ. God, we ask all these things in the precious name of your son, Jesus, today. Amen. Guys, thanks so much for being here. I want to encourage you this week, wherever you go, to go out, to grow in and reflect Christ's light to our world. God bless you guys. Have a great week.